we need to focus on our friendships. We need to, romantic relationships are important, but we also need to, to take care of our friends and take care of our friendships and um, really nurture those relationships as well. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Fitzgerald from readinggroupguides.com, a website from the Book Report Network, and I'm the host of the Book Reporter Talks To video podcast series. Welcome to Bookachino Live Book Group event, where our guest this evening is Janet Skeslian Charles, and we're going to be discussing her novel, The Paris Library, which was an instant New York Times bestseller and a Book Reporter Bets on selection when it came out in hardcover last year, and now it's out in paperback. I had the pleasure of being one of the first people to interview Janet about the Paris Library back at ABA's Winter Institute in January of 2020. I was so excited. She was so articulate of being able to share her passion for her book and the story behind it. And I knew I wanted to have her as a guest. But what happened was the book was held a year. So I interviewed her for a big book reporter talks to interview in 2021 when the book came out. But we heard from a lot of readers that they were reading this with their book clubs or they wanted to be able to discuss the book. So we wanted to invite her to be one of our Booker Chino Live book, book, book club guests. So here's the format for tonight's event. Let me start by noting that we're assuming that you have read the book. We're assuming that you're not faking it because we will talk spoilers. We will talk what's happened in the book. I'm gonna begin with a discussion with Janet and then five members of the audience are going to be joining us to share their questions live. And then we're gonna take questions from the audience, which we ask you to drop into the Q&A section down below. You can chat as much as you want amongst yourselves, chit chat away. But if you have a question that you wanna pose that we'll ask Janet later on, put it in the Q&A section. So Austin who acts as our voice of God doesn't have to scroll through chat looking for your comments. So, the um, Q&A is only going to be shared with uh, the uh, panelists. So the chatting is going to happen on the other side. And we're not going to be looking at the chat. So if you say like kind things, we'll look at them later. How's that? And with that housekeeping behind us, let's welcome Janet to the stage. Hello, everyone. And hello, Carol. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you. I am so excited to see you again and be able to talk about this book. Let's see, we've been talking about it 20, 21, 22. And I absolutely love because we're gonna have different perspectives on it all the time. Because the beginning, no one had read it. Second time, some people had read it. And third time, we're assuming all these people have read it, which is very, very, very exciting. So thank you for joining us tonight. We were gonna do this, just so you know, folks, we were gonna do this a little bit earlier in the year when a book first came out, but Janet was in Paris. And that would mean she would have to stay up till 2 a.m. to chat with us. So we waited till she's on vacation in Montana so we could have some kind of a reasonable conversation with her instead of her up in the middle of the night. So let's start with a really easy question at the beginning. Every book begins with an idea. And what was the idea for the Paris Library? Like, how did this thought come to you of what to do? Well, there are so many ideas that run through a person's brain. And I think one of the ideas for this book was really friendship and how important friendship is. And I, I was thinking about romance novels and how our definition of romance has changed through the ages in the 1970s, um, or even the movie with uh, John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara, where um, it's the man takes charge and, um, and, um, and all of a woman's energy is put into those romantic relationships. Um, and I was thinking, we need to focus on our friendships. We need to, romantic relationships are important, but we also need to, to take care of our friends and take care of our friendships and um, really nurture those relationships as well. So that was one of the thoughts that I had um, in creating Lily and her friend, um, creating Odile and Margaret, um, just friendships and how we sustain friendships and how friendships survive during hard times and ups and downs when we're no longer in the same places. You know, when we're in high school, a lot of times we're in the same place and then we move away, away, away. And how do we come together again? 
Mm -hmm. And when you do come back, you're a different person and you're bringing different things to the story. But by the same token, you have that history with each other and you can always come back to the history. And I think that's the most fun part about seeing old friends is that shared remembering you on the playground, but also where you are in your life now. Exactly, exactly. But I think in today's society, it's so easy to block people or it's so easy to say, I, I'm done with you. And I wanted to explore relationships where people put in the hard work and, uh, or didn't put in the hard work and uh, just the consequences of those choices. Mm -hmm. And also people being there for each other. Because during the time of this book, you had to be there for each other. It was not like every person was for themselves. You had to be there to help others. And it was one of those things that I think we get divorced from a lot. And I think during the pandemic, we understood being there for each other. Yeah. What can I do? Can I give you the wipes or toilet paper? Like, which things do you need? Yeah. And it was that bringing back to people of sort of the basics. And you were in Paris during that time. And what was it like? What was it like over there? Like, what? Were people all there for each other? Well, we were in pretty serious lockdown that first time where we could only go half a mile in any direction from our uh, from our where we lived and everything was closed and you couldn't you couldn't bike, you could only walk. Um, so it was really it was really a challenging, a really challenging time. And so that's when you realize how important, you know, um, your frontline workers are, you know, working in grocery stores, and of course, the medical staff, things like this. Um, I think people were kinder to each other, and, uh, and uh, maybe more patient, and realizing how important others are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was, that was definitely a lesson we were walking away from. So in this book, we've got these two storylines, we've got 1939, which we all understand, that one storyline, what made you pick 1983 for the second storyline? What, how did that one gravitate that, oh, that's the right, that's the right decade to be in? Well, they, um, I was looking for points during World War II that connected with the Cold War. And so we had that um, um, ominous feeling before World War II happened, where we just didn't know what would happen. Um, and I felt like the Cold War echoed that, where we just were always on guard or always nervous. And I grew up in Montana where we have all these missile silos that we drive past. These are, these are weapons that it, they take a half an hour to get to Moscow and um, can blow the place apart. And we drove by those missile silos, just like we drove by the church, just like we drove by the school, like they were nothing at all. They just were an ordinary part of our landscape. And thinking back on that and thinking back on the eighties and the cold war, it was just a very strange feeling. So for the book, I had to find I had to do two different timelines in two different wars, and I had to find the intersections. So we start with the we start with this this feeling of apprehension, knowing that Europe is going to go into war in 1939. But we also feel it in 1983 because the Soviets shot down that passenger airline, um, and children were on board. Um, so many uh, civilians were on board and they were killed. And just, I remember that, that feeling and, and Ronald Reagan on the television addressing the nation um, about just the, the chilling, the, the chilling um, consequences of, of that. So I think I stared at the wall for about eight months um, while I was trying to find that, that timeline and, mm -hmm. and um, reading up on missiles and things like that um, to just try to find those, those connections. But on a personal level, I grew up in the 80s. And so I grew up with gunny sacks dresses and that Giorgio perfume and, and all of the things um, in the book. And I just kind of wanted to enjoy that time, maybe in a way that I do now that I didn't then because it was so stressful for me then. Um, but um, so that's why I chose the 80s. And I never thought, um, you know, I thought the Cold War was over. I never imagined that um, Russia would attack Ukraine. I never, you know, I never imagined um, what would happen now. And so many readers write to say that the book is, is so relevant. And I'm really sorry that it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I do remember I was in school in the 60s and they used to tell us to go under our desks if the if the siren went off. And I still think to this day of like what was going to happen if we went under the desk like it was the desk was going to fall on top of us. And that was like about it, you know. Yes. 
but it was, uh, oh, this is what you should be doing. And I was just there like thinking back now, it's like, wow, that was pretty crazy that they said that was your, that was your line of defense. That was what you were going to do, crawl under your desk. So what brought you to Paris at the beginning? You've been living there for years. What brought you to there? For, what was the, the, uh, the reason for going in the first place? I went to France for a job. Um, they have a, a program for recent graduates. Uh, you can be a teaching assistant in a local school. So I was in Alsace-Lorraine from 1998 to 1999. Um, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to go there and have a work visa and have everything taken care of, to work with students, to meet people. And I met my husband during that time. And so I renewed my work contract, I renewed my work contract, and then I married my husband and that's a long-term contract. So um, that's how I got there, but I never really moved there. I just went for a year and a lot of people do that. I think in, in all, all parts of the world, go for a year and then life happens. Life happens and you come back for the summer. You come back yeah. in the summer and yeah. that's about it, you know? But what was it like working in the library? Because you actually worked in the Paris library. What was this like? What was it like to be doing this? I I had a really hard time in Paris. I was a lot like Margaret, where I didn't have a lot of friends or I didn't have any friends because as a as a teaching assistant, it was a year to year contract. So when I was in the schools, people thought, well, she's why well, get to know her? She's just going to be moving on after a year. And so when I worked at the library, it was really the first place that I'd had a long term contract and felt like I was really a part of something. And so it was really wonderful to um, have those habitués. I wrote about Odile and her habitués, the ones that came every day. And I, um, I was the programs manager. So I had writers or journalists or artists come in and talk about their work every week. And every week I had the same core group of people who came to the events. And so it was really lovely to have that relationship and, and see how, having those events could help with people's solitude or help mm -hmm. give them a subject of conversation or give them something to look forward to each week. And that was really something wonderful. Was there any program that you enjoyed doing the most? Was it when the authors came in or was it historical presentations? Was there something that was your, the thing that you enjoyed the most out of that job? I think um, my highlight was having Tatiana de Rone who wrote Sarah's Key. Yes. because she was just so gracious she was of all the guests we had during the time I was there she was just so gracious and of course it's the American Library in Paris so it's going the programs are all in English and one lady crossed France um spent a day um to get there and she was French and she didn't realize the program would be in in mm -hmm. English and was just devastated because she only spoke French. And so Tatiana took the time to console her. The woman brought her a rose. So it just to see those connections with authors is so special. Yeah. And have you had those some kind of things when you go on the road? Like, are there any events that you remember that that was really a terrific moment? I'm sure there are a lot of them, but is there one that you really remember? For, for me, my own book? Yeah. For traveling here? Um, I remember um, just seeing people that you don't expect to see. When I did my events in Montana, people I hadn't seen for 20 years and who kindly came, the, um, the assistant principal of my high school um, many, many years ago who'd moved away, who came. Um, Jamie Ford kindly came to one of my events. He's got a book out, I'm excited about that. Um, so just really just the support. Um, one of my former bosses, I was a maid in a hotel in high school and she and her husband and granddaughter came to an event um that was pretty far away for them so it was really nice to see that support now that community coming together did when you were at the library did they tell you stories about the history of the library right away or did that come later like the whole like do they get up and say okay let me tell you you're new this is what you need to know or did it come or, or organically it you know, people didn't talk about it. I worked there from 2010 to 2012, and it wasn't on the website. People weren't really talking about it. But uh, there was an older gentleman, an Italian man named Simone Gallo, who had worked at the library since the Nixon administration, and he knew everything. But he's very shy, very reticent, um, would not offer information, but if you ask him questions and the right questions, he can tell you everything. And so he and a colleague were talking about former librarians because there was a librarian from Idaho right after the war and they were going to do an exhibit on her, um, Ruth Burney, I think. And so Simone started talking about the World War II history and it just, I wanted to know more. So I Googled and uh, 
I found the report that Dorothy Reeder had written marked confidential about the library on the American Library Association um, art um, on the Library Association website. And that just gave me chills. Reading her words gave me chills. And I thought if I can do that for a reader, I'd be um, I'd be thrilled. Wow. Well, and, and it's funny how like a little idea will be like if you hadn't gone to work there, you wouldn't have seen this, you wouldn't have learned this man just giving you a little bit of tips. And then going, wait, can I learn more quickly? And then how can I share the story? And it's how stories come in very different ways. It's not like everybody just presented like on a platter. Here's your story. Go take it and write it. Exactly, exactly. And what's what's what got me working at the library is that there's a rule in Paris that all facade building facades have to be cleaned every so so often. And so my building, I live in a huge apartment complex. And so the scaffolding going up, the, the clanging, the men walking by the windows, the psh of the water, I knew I wouldn't be able to write at home. Um, I'd written my book, uh, my first book, I was wanting to write a second book, but I knew it would take over a year for, for the scaffolding to go up, the cleaning, the, the working on the building renovations. So I got this job at the library. So it was really all down to that rule in Paris about cleaning facades of buildings. Okay. Well, this is what happens. It's like, we're coming with the scaffolding. Okay, I've got to get out. This is what I'm going to do next. You know, Odile was inspired by a real person. So tell us about that because there's some background story there, correct? I, um, well, when my first book came out, Moonlight in Odessa, there was, an, there was a French um, bookseller named Odile Hillier. And uh, she owned a bookshop called The Village Voice. And she was, she just, it was just a wonderful bookshop. She had it until she was 70 years old and then she retired. But she kept my book on her table for years. And I, for those of you who know the book business, you know, you have three months at best, sometimes only a month on a table because there's so many books coming out and every book deserves its chance. And so her support just meant the world to me. And so I named my character Odile after this wonderful bookseller, um, this wonderful French bookseller. So she had a bob and she kind of had henna hair. And so I physically um, based older Odile off of her. And uh, I just, I so appreciate our, every, everybody in the book business. Thank you, Carol, for everything you do for, for us authors to connect readers and, and, and books. We love doing it. We absolutely, I, you know, I absolutely love doing it. And I love hearing stories like that of people who have made those connections and then you celebrate her. And it must be really cool. Like, oh, here I am. I'm in this book. You know what I mean? Um, so I have to ask you, if you worked at the library during that time, during World War II, would you have been brave enough to carry the books the way they did, bringing them to the Jewish people? Would you have been, and I go back and forth on these questions like all the time. So what do you think? You know, it's such a hard question because the um, ambassador, the American ambassador, William Bullitt, told Americans to leave in the summer of 1939. He told them again in the spring of 1940. Um, in fact, um, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt told him to leave, told Ambassador Bullitt to leave. Ambassador Bullitt did not leave. None of the library staff left. Um, they all continued and, and delivered books. And you like to think you would be that brave, but I have to say, if an ambassador told me to leave, I know I, I did. go. <laughs> I know, um, you know, my, my mother-in-law passed away recently and we knew this story about 1939. She'd been born in the States and her father wanted to go back to Germany and they went back to Germany. And while they were there, he did not agree with what Hitler was doing. And they left in 1939 and they have her passport with her little brothers, like a stamp on the passport. That's all it was. But if they didn't leave at that time, the completely different life that people would have had. And you think about it, if you'd stayed in Paris at that time, what your life would have been differently, you know, compared to what has gone on. And I just think it's like, you know, one of that, those amazing moments. So it is. It, it, I, have, I have to say, when I, um, I was in the States when COVID broke out, because I was, I was there doing um, publicity for the book um, in March of 2020. And I always thought, you know, if, if a catastrophe happens, I'm heading home, I'm heading yeah. to Montana. But I actually flew back to France. So what I thought I would do, I didn't do. So mm -hmm. you just, you never know. Even if we think we know, we don't know. Yeah, and you think you've got a plan and you think, you know, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen with my life. And then things go up in the air and you're like, wait, I'm going to go in this different direction. And you think about during the war, how the different directions could have taken you to different places and it could have totally changed your life. 
and I was, you know, I may never have met my husband and they living in Germany. So uh, yes, yes. <laughs> we're going to have um, an exchange student in Germany. Yeah, that's exactly. I would have been the exchange student. That would have been it with my use of language. I think I, I think I have 14 years of Spanish and I can do nothing. I'm just impossible. It's the worst. Oh, you'll surprise yourself. Yeah, exactly. We'll see. So we're going to have a couple of audience members join us at this time that have questions for you, which we're, we're super excited about. And the first one is going to be Debbie Moore. Debbie Moore has uh, participated in many of these events, and we love when she joins us and shares her questions. So um, Austin is going to bring her up at this time. So welcome, Debbie. So good to see you again. You too, Carol. Hi, Janet. It's uh, really nice to meet you. And uh, I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your book. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you know, books play an, a very important part in your story, in both your storylines with Odile and Lily. Um, was it the power of books to transform and transport people that drew you to tell the story? I think so. And, and libraries themselves, I remember being in junior high and just being so overwhelmed with my thoughts and going um, during class to the library and just sticking my head on the forehead, my forehead on the table of the library and just that coolness and the, of, of, of the wood and just, it, it just calmed my mind and the, and the school librarian was so kind um, and gave us that refuge. And so I wanted to talk about libraries as these places, these third places where, where we can seek refuge and seek knowledge, seek friendship and, uh, and seek connections. And of course, reading is solitary, but um, as Carol shows, it's also, uh, it's also very much a group activity um, and we form so many wonderful connections in this way. Did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, it certainly does. I, I mean, I belong to three book clubs and each one of them is different, but it's so wonderful to share the stories. Um, you had mentioned when you were talking to Carol that when you were at the Paris Library, that they really didn't talk much about the librarians during the World War. What was their reaction when you were doing publicity? Did you find people came up to you and had a story to tell you or were really surprised by the story you told? Well, I think by the time the book came out a decade later, the library had updated their website. And so they had the chronology, the 100, because they were also preparing for the centennial. One of the reasons the book came out in 2020 was because it was to coincide with the centennial of the American Library. And so for the centennial, they had done a huge amount of work to update the website, to have photos ready. So they had really done a huge amount of work to, to prepare um, just to, to be able to talk about the different uh, different phases of the library and the different locations, things like this. So I think people um, people in Paris knew um, uh, who were members knew a little bit about the library story. Great, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Debbie. Thanks as always for joining us. Really, really love it. So Colleen is going to join us now with her question, um, and as she's coming up on screen. It's, it's interesting how much you remember the library when you were a child. I mean, I know for me, with a bookmobile used to come to the corner. And I remember they used to make this sound like as, the, as it came down. And then you'd wait to go on and you'd know to go get your books. And it was one time I went down and there was books on this lower shelf. And I said, I'm going to go get books on the lower shelf. And they go, do your mother know you're reading those books? And it was probably like Phyllis Whitney romances or something like that. And I was like, Oh yeah, my mother completely knows what I'm doing. And when we actually, I learned later that our library in town was a Carnegie library. And there are all these things that as a kid, it wouldn't have mattered to you. But now when you realize what's going on, and I remember when they put on the edition and it was this whole new modern wing. And I looked the other day and realized how long that's been open. And I was like, no, 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 I'm still 27. So it's like, I, that was just yesterday that when that library went up, it couldn't be that long, but it's those things that you remember of being in the library. There's, there's a favorite book of mine. And I remember exactly the corner it was in, in the library. Like I know exactly where that book was. And years later, a reader gifted me. They found this book. Um, it's called a trace of footprints by Ruth Wolf. And it was out of print. I didn't know anything about Ruth Wolf. Didn't know anything, but finding that book was like finding gold when somebody sent it to me. And it was just that moment. Thank you. So Colleen, I'm holding you up on, here's your question. Go for it. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Well, I pick up a book about Paris and I was gobsmacked 
that it also included Freud, Montana. And I'm from the western part of the state, and I was I had to go look it up. So my question to you is, how did you choose Freud, Montana as a location? Well, my neighbors here in Shelby, Montana, um, have family in Freud. And I really wanted, um, I think, dotting the West, there are a lot of towns um, who have French names like Freud. So I really wanted Odile to be in a town with a French name. And Freud, of course, means foie. It, it, it means cold in French and she did receive a cold reception. So I thought that was apropos. Mm -hmm. And then Freud, all of the psychology behind the things that we do and the, and our choices and things like that. So I liked kind of that double meaning of the town. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, and I'm from Montana. So it was important to me to have the story set in Montana. I just want you to know that since Yellowstone, I want to go to Montana for only one reason. I want to be able to say, let's take the chopper. Like, oh, they oh. take too long. Let's take the chopper. And every time we turn on the show, I say to my husband, just remember, that's what I really love. It's like, let's go take the chopper. It's too far to drive. He won't make it. And I, it's always like somebody won't make it. So they have to take the chopper. But I just, I like love those kind of moments where there's this sweeping part of the American West that is tied into the story. And it's this part where, a lot of us haven't been. I haven't been to Montana. There are a lot of people who haven't been to Montana. And there are those places you don't know that much about. And I remember when I was working in the magazine, we would tour the country and do makeovers on people, which is really a funny thing to do. And I remember going to places like Grand Forks and going to Fargo and going to these places. And as a result, I felt like when we started doing this company, we understood America more. Because a lot of times in publishing, people think of the East Coast and the West Coast. The East Coast is where the books come out. The West Coast is where the movies get made based on the books. And there's a whole part of the country that there are a lot of people that just love to read and they really love to, to gather. And when you can sit there and have these conversations where tonight people, I know if we look in the chat are from all different places around the country. And I think that that's so nice because to see a book set in those two different places, I think of Paris as, oh, we're gonna have croissants. So we're gonna go do this. And then we're in Montana. I love the mix. I love the yin and yang on it. Thank you, Colleen. We may come visit sometime. Oh, it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place from end to end, from Freud to Missoula. It's a beautiful place. I tell you, I, I, at some point I said, I'm going to leave my desk and that's what I'll do. I'll go west. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Colleen. Thank you. Jean is having trouble getting online, but I do have her questions here. So I'm going to talk about this. She was fascinated by an article that you wrote in the Chicago Tribune, which we're actually going to link to from the uh, video that we do from, from this event and from the podcast, which chronicled your search for one of the missing Paris librarians. So can you tell us about that? Because it sounds fascinating of what you did. Well, there is this wonderful staff photo of the, of the librarians. And there's this beautiful, beautiful woman that we didn't really know that much about. And we thought her name was Jeanette Etlinger and we thought Etlinger was her, her maiden name. And she was a Jewish librarian from Chicago. She worked at the American Library in Paris. And in 1939, she disappeared from the American Library Association archives as well as the American Library in Paris archives. And I thought she had maybe perished in the war. I thought she disappeared. And in fact, she didn't disappear, she got married. She went from being Jeanette Etlinger to Mrs. Herbert E. King. And that's why, that's why I lost track of her. And so um, I, I didn't include her in the book because I didn't know her story. But even after the book was published, um, I kept an eye out for her and was looking for her. And the assistant um, director of the American Library in Paris felt the same way. And so she got on Ancestry.com and was able to find all of this amazing information about Mrs. Herbert E. King. Um, and unfortunately, um, Jeanette Etlinger, um, as Mrs. Herbert E. King um, was arrested by, by the Nazis and she um, was taken prisoner along with her husband, a journalist and 145 other people, people working in consulates, um, volunteers, and they ended up as guests of the German government in Baden-Baden, Germany. And so the first thing that Jeanette did was start a library. And so during the 15 months of captivity, um, when the diplomats were finally released and the newspaper men and the volunteers um, and the ambassadors were finally released, they said, well, not ambassadors, but um, 
embassy staff, they all said the same thing that, that Jeanette's, um, Jeanette's library is the one thing that got them, got them through. They also noted there was never enough food or alcohol. Um, <laughs> See, in the embassy, they would have had those things. It's just yeah. not going to happen. And, you know, big, big, that's not going to happen for you, you know? Yes. Yeah, so it was really, it was really interesting to, and that's, that's what's really hard about research is women disappear because they they aren't, we change our names. And so it's, it's really, it's really challenging. I wish we were all kind of more like the Spanish where I think both names are, both names are kept. It would be easier for researchers. You know, it's funny because I didn't, my maiden name doesn't show up any place. And it's funny because I think if anybody's really trying to find me, it's like, you'd have to know I married Tom Fitzgerald, either that or you wouldn't know. So you're right. Trying to track people down, especially of a certain age, they're, 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 if the names were changed, it was very difficult to find the people yes. and track them down. So do you think that that research of trying to find her led to other discoveries that might be a future book? Yes. Um, yes, I was, I'm working on a book now set in World War I about a library, and uh, it's, a, um, it, well, it's about a, an American librarian who goes to France, and she works to smiles from the front um, in, in World War I, and she changed, she revolutionizes the French library system. Oh, and, wow. Uh, there weren't any female librarians at the time, and uh, I think women weren't um, women weren't encouraged to get jobs um, at that time. And so, 350 American women went over to rebuild France and uh, um, nine, uh, northern France, 90% of which was decimated. So it is interesting that one librarian leads to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like okay, this is where my story is going to go. I'm going to go backwards in time. Is there going to be a forward story as well, or is there going to be only in um, the uh, World War One? There is, there is a, there is a forward story um, set set in the in the 1990s. I do, I, I actually hate books that go back and forth in time, so it's funny that I write them. But um, it, I, it's not that I hate them. It's that I love sinking into a book and spending time with a character. And then after a few pages, when we're ripped from that character and put into another time and place, and we kind of have to get comfortable again with a new character in a new place before we're ripped away again. Um, so uh, it's odd that I do it, but I do. Yeah, yeah. And you know what it is too? It's interesting because if you're listening on audio, a lot of times the jump can be difficult because you have to really listen that we're now in 1949 or we're now in 1909. And if you don't listen to that, you don't realize the story has shifted. And I'm in a book club. And I know that a number of people have noted that when the times switch back and forth, it's more difficult to figure out what's going on. So there's a this little bit, there's an audio challenge that people have to take on. You know? Maybe the maybe the audio bookmakers need to have a little music or something before yes. the time shift to kind of help signal the brain. See, if you're yours, it's a musical interludes. We'll be joining her audiobooks from here on in. But it is interesting because you do, you're thinking in this one time period and then it switches. And then, okay, then you sometimes, and if you are a very good writer because you actually remember, like the thread continues. Some people, the thread jumps. And as a result, you're completely lost of trying to figure out who these people are. Or I find that if when you jump back in, a new character is interjected on that first page, it's completely startling. And it's something you really don't think about until you're in the audio process and then you're, or the editing process. And you're like, who is this person? And why don't I know anything about her? And here she is. Yes, yes, it can be, it can be challenging. Absolutely can. So we're going to be joined by another reader. It's Laura Beth Viter. I think I've got her last name correct. And she has a number of questions for you. So Laura Beth, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Janet, for coming. I appreciate you being here. Um, just real quick. Just real quick, I did listen to the audiobook, so just to fill in on that, and you had tr uh, three narrators, and they did a phenomenal job, and because you have three different voices, it was very easy to keep track of the timelines and the storylines, so kudos to your producers on that, because it, it worked for me, so good job. Oh, great. Oh, I'm so glad um, to hear that. Uh, you did mention earlier that there wasn't a lot of research there for you, I mean, it wasn't laid out for you, in other words, and you had to really dig deep to find it, so what did you find that was most fascinating that sort of surprised you along the way that you can share with us? I think it was the little things. Um, I read a year of library journal back issues um, in the 1940s to find out what librarians were 
um, kind of faced with the, the challenges that they were faced with in the States. And I learned that um, there were germaphobes even back then that there were some people who did not want to check out a book that had already been checked out because they were worried about germs. And I always think of that as kind of like a modern, um, modern concern. And so it's just all of the things that made me realize people are people no matter what the age. I, um, I was interested in finding more about the Nazi library protector, Dr. Hermann Fuchs. And so I, uh, I wrote to the state library in Berlin and asked for his personnel file. And so when they sent me his photo and he looked so mild mannered, um, I was really surprised because in my mind, you know, when you see Nazis in movies, it's really, you know, they really, of course, are typecast and looked apart, but it was just a reminder that ordinary people did this to other people. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Um, I also want to know, well, I want to say that I appreciated that your characters lived in a gray zone. They, there was nothing that was black or white. There was just so much gray. And, and I think that's, that's what how we live right so why was it important for you to have these characters that weren't completely good or completely bad to transform your novel well I think really that's how how life is and I think that's how we are and no one is totally good or totally bad and I think it's important to run I think from from a distance World War II especially looks black and white Nazis bad um and there were people who collaborated or were in the resistance. But I think it, in, through this book, we realized that there was a bit of both and, and people did good things and bad things and were victims of their circumstances. And um, of course there were, there were heroes and, and people who were in the resistance, but, but a lot of people were just trying to survive. And I really wanted to highlight, um, I really wanted to highlight the heroes like the librarians who delivered books, but also people like Margaret who um, you know, fell in love with the wrong person or Odile, who was heroic in some ways, but deeply flawed in others. And I guess it's just important to, to remember that history is a lot more complicated than we, than we make it out to be. Well, they were very endearing and we appreciated it. Um, I wanted to also ask, I'm sure there, there are a lot of World War II historical fiction fans like me in the audience. So can you tell us, for those of us that love that genre, what are some others that you would recommend? And heck, I'll open it up to any book that you want to recommend to us to read. Oh, you know something? I don't. I did not read a lot of World War II books. I forbid myself to read them because I did not want to. I I didn't want to be. Um, I, I I didn't want to be influenced. So I was kind of afraid to look at World War II books. Um, so that's not a that's not really a time period that I that I that I know very well. There is a book that came out in England, the little um, the little war library, and I didn't re realize this. It's um, a, the true story of a, a library that was bombed, and so they took the the books that remained, and they ended up in um, in a tube station. So for a big part of the war, um, there was a library in the tube station. And so it was run by women. And I thought it was really, um, I thought it was just a really endearing story. And I thought having worked in a library, I, I thought she captured the problems of libraries very well. And uh, so I, yes, that was, that's when I think from that period that I've read recently and really, really enjoyed. What Kate Thompson is the author. The Little War Library by Kate Thompson. What other books, not World War II, I assume character-driven novels that you have enjoyed that, that you would recommend to us? I love Bel Canto. That's, I think, my favorite book. I just, I, um, I've underlined so many passages of that book that uh, the whole book is underlined by now because I've, I've read it so many times and each time something else speaks to me. So I just, I absolutely... I absolutely love that. I, um, I think Good Morning Midnight is a book by Jean Rhys, who is ahead of her time. And she talks about what it's like to be in Paris when you're alone and lonely and having a hard time. And since so much of Paris is idealized, I really like her take on it. It's an older book, um, but I, I just think it's beautiful. So I think those, those are two of my recommendations. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Beth, I have a question for you because everybody keeps yes. asking, are those really your bookshelves behind you? 
Yes, look, they're pretty. Me- it's pretty messy. Sorry, oh, it's, it's gorgeous. Like, yeah, I know everyone seen. is impressed. Right in. <laughs> Thank you. And everybody's asking in the portrait behind. I just want you to know, oh. setting wise, you're absolutely winning. I mean, people are loving this. That's my bridal portrait up there. Oh. See, I went to Rice University. That's the, that's our university right there. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely Thanks. love it. That was just sitting there and we're like. Wait a second. Did she just build that background? You know, is she moving in front of the background? What's happening? It's Green way screen. too messy. Look, it's way too messy for it to be built. No, it's authentic. It's so authentic. It's authentic. It looks like, it looks like somebody is writing a book and there's all their research books sitting behind them, doesn't it? I mean, really? Well, I do run a, a mobile library. You're talking about the mobile. I run it for Meals on Wheels. So when I deliver meals, I deliver books. And so I read and then I hand off to them and it circulates quite a bit. But they, I have about 80 books out right now to them. So it's been a fun process. <laughs> That's a really fun process. Oh, I love that. Well, books are as nourishing as food. So I love that. Thank you. Wow. Absolutely. I had a librarian friend years ago and I had a friend that I'd met, believe it or not, through Simon and Garfunkel. It's just too long a story. I'm not going to bore you, but she lived in um, Salem, Oregon at the time. And I met a librarian from Salem and I said, oh, and she said, we do this book project where we bring things to people that are older in their homes. And I said, oh, my friend Eleanor Nooksall lives there. And she says, I deliver to Eleanor. So you talk about this moment at the at ALA meeting where I just sat there going, my whole life just went full circle. Like it's yeah. bringing books to her. And she says, oh, such an avid reader. And I think there's this thing that just connects readers wherever you are. You just sit there and want to be talking to each other about what's going on. But I love that you're sharing books with others as well. That's like really, really fabulous. Well, I got the chill bumps on that story and from her quote in the darkness of war, the light of books. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Something definitely to think about. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And next thank up you. is going to be Wanda. Well, let's see if I can do this. Madrinich, um, who's going to be joining us now. So I got this little screen where people are popping up. And this is what I love. Juan has been in a book group that's been meeting since 1965, okay, 1965. And they are going to be discussing your book next week. And she's chairing the discussion. So I think it's pretty cool that she was able to join us tonight and be able to ask you a question before she starts meeting with her group next week. So Wanda's going to turn her her camera on and ask you a question. Hello, Wanda. Oh, Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you, Janet, and uh, nice you. loved your book. And as they say, uh, it, it's just a coincidence that we're meeting on Monday, on uh, Tuesday evening, and uh, I, I'm going to a- uh, be able to impart some nice information. Uh, one of the things before I get into the book, what what took you to the Ukraine at that at that particular time? I was in I was in Odessa, Ukraine, from 1994 to 1996, and I went there to teach English as a second language with the Soros Foundation. And I grew up um, in the in the 1980s um, in the Cold War, and all of the photos we saw of the Soviets were in black and white, waiting in line um, for things. And I just thought there had to be more to the story. There just had to be more to the story. People are people. And um, I grew up working at a movie theater and it had a big big velvet curtain that came down. And of course we always talked about the Iron Curtain at the time during the Cold War. And so in my mind, I mixed the the Iron Curtain and that red velvet curtain. And I just wanted to peek behind the Iron Curtain. And that's why I got a job in Odessa, Ukraine. Um, We said tonight I live in Montana. Montana can be minus 40 degrees in the winter. So I wasn't so interested in going places like Moscow or St. Petersburg, where it could also be minus 40 in the winter. I wanted to go someplace a little sunny or someplace um, a little warmer. And Odessa, Ukraine is a beautiful city on the Black Sea. Um, And that's why that's why I really wanted to go. I just I just wanted to meet the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, Um, in the book. One of my my questions is, who was the father of Odile's baby? There is really kind of a question mark in my mind. So, um, well, she, um, it, it's true it could have been either Paul or Buck, but um, Odile, um, like a lot of women at that time, because of the, of the, the scant nutrition 
um, I think um, there was a there was an there was an article um, in the newspaper. It was an interview with Helen Fickweiler that that said she lost like in in the in the period of a year she lost like 15 pounds mm -hmm. in two years and 15 pounds just from the summer of 1939 to when she returned to the states in 1941. So she wasn't there the entire war. So these women, I think they you know a lot, some of them stopped menstruating because they were just so so thin. And so for me, she couldn't have been pregnant by Paul just because her body wasn't able to carry a, 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 a pregnancy. So I think she got pregnant when she was in Montana with Buck. Okay, because when she was going to be married and, and we're talking about babies and she said, oh, there'll be one soon. So that was why I wasn't quite sure who's, whose baby it was. But anyway. Yes, I think she was hopeful. I think she was hopeful. Okay. Um, was there a spy in the library? Well, I think Madame Simone was a woman who started off um, on a friendly terms with Professor Cohen, but as the war developed, she became more and more angry and bitter at Madame Cohen, and she became very, Madame Simone became very anti-Semitic, and so she denounced Professor Cohen um, so that Madame Simone could have her apartment. And, um, that happened quite a lot, I'm afraid, where neighbors or employers or employees or even family members denounced each other to gain apartments and things mm. like that. So she would have been part of all those, the, the Crow. Um, so she yeah. was the one who wrote those specific Crow letters about the about the library. Okay, okay. well, that was great. One of the things that I really got out of your book is why we appreciate reading and all those little things you're never alone when you're reading a book. There's always someone with you. And there's, I have highlighted uh, several in the books. And I thought, well, yes, that's true. Why are, you know, why do we love to read? Because there's, there's, it gives us so much. And as they say, you're never alone. And um, I really appreciated all of that. And I'm, I'm going to highlight it. At, at the book club tomorrow too and see how everyone feels about it. I mean, I started going to a library. I was, I don't know, eight, nine years old and to read a book, that's where you had to go to read. It. And I read everything and so on. So uh, I've loved it and uh, I've loved our book club and, and it, it just brings such joy and friendship. And we get in, we really get to know our members because we're a very small club and uh, I'll be glad to relate a lot of the information to them. And thank you so much. Well, thank you. Well, it's true. You know, we're so lucky to have books. And I, some of my favorite books, I feel like the characters are my dearest friends. And every time I, every time I open what, a book I've already read, it is like finding another friend. Yeah. And I was sad to, um, the books that I mentioned, I had to have a cutoff date of about 1939. And I would have loved to have mentioned a lot of books later, like A Tree Grows Up in Brooklyn. I love that book, such a beautiful book. But at the time, um, and I think Odile would have loved it, but I, it just wasn't the, the time. But, but reading about those people again, it's just like finding a friend. So I agree with you totally, Wanda. Well, it is such a bonus and thank you too, Carol, of what you're doing that you get authors on. And uh, it really makes it special when you're reading a book to be able to talk to the author. Thank you. And can't wait for the next one. Oh, thank you. Thank and I'm you. looking forward to Wanda, you being able to talk to your book group yeah. and see what they are all bringing to the conversation. What they're all gonna bring besides what you learned from Janet. And I think there's nothing better than sitting in a room with people and you've yeah. all read the book and say, wait a second, I didn't see that at all. I didn't see that coming at all. You know? Oh, absolutely. And we all, uh, some books are very controversial and, <clears throat> or uh, books are chosen and, you know, you're reading it and you think, mm, I don't know why it, it's unanimous, the books that, that we uh, choose, but then you get to book club and you get their ideas mm -hmm. and, oh, this is why they suggested this book and, and read it. So it's, um, you really, really learn a lot and we read everything you know and and so on so it's 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 been a long long ride we've even done poetry and so on and whatever so it's um books are wonderful just mm -hmm. wonderful thank you thank you so much for joining us and it's funny janet that you mentioned a tree grows in brooklyn because our group is reading that next month 
because we've decided that we have we haven't done classics. We they're books that we've missed through the years. And they decided, and it's really fun because I am much older than the women in my book club. I'm so thrilled that they have me as part of it. They're all in their 40s. And it's so much fun to get to know people who have different kinds of thoughts. Like I'm hearing about their children being in school. I'm hearing about all these things. And it's so much fun to hear what's happening in people's lives besides hearing what's happening with books. And I think that those conversations, once again, you just hear a little bit more about what's going on and it gives you perspective, a different perspective. Exactly. Well, I'm so jealous of the people discovering a tree grows in Brooklyn for the first time. What a discovery. I know. I'm like, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm trying to remember if I've read it and I'm trying to remember which shelf it's on in this house. And I'm hoping it's not boxed up because it was one of the kids' books, you know? Like I could just be going through all the books in the attic now. So now we're going to go to something special. We're going to go to reader questions, which means your reader questions need to be dropped in the Q&A down below. I see some people there. And um, Austin, before you start doing those, can you just pop up Tom Donatio? Because I want to give our editorial director a shout out and a huge thank you from all of us. So if Tom could be the person that turns on his camera, I want him to get to say hi to everybody. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> It's like that thing I think happens at least once in every there you conversation. Go. There you go. Everybody, great to have you all here. This is Tom Donatio. He is our editorial director. He does, he's been with us how many years now, Tom? Don't date me. Uh, this is my 20th year. 20th year of being with us. And we're around for Lies 26. Back so fast. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom has been, um, he assigns the books. He edits the book reviews. He gets everything up on the site. He decides what the schedule is going to be. We review it together. We take a look at what's going on. And from there, we work on the newsletter. So I am usually, I'll be perfectly honest, I write the opener and the closers of the newsletter. And a lot of the meat in there is all this guy. So I want everybody to give him a round, loud round of applause for me because I'm the face of the site. But Tom is so much of the heart and soul. And I want to make Thank sure you very much, he gets Carol. credit. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's just absolutely unbelievable because every week we'll sit there and go, oh, okay, what are we going to do? And I'll say, um, are we getting this book reviewed? Yes. And he is on top of every single thing and finds the exact right reviewer. So, and our reviewer absolutely here. love the Paris Library. So oh, great to, uh, to have you here. And uh, yeah, it's been a great, great discussion. Well, yeah. thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And Austin, do you have questions that everybody is coming up with? I do indeed have questions. Uh, we've got a few here. Some of them may have been touched on a little bit already, but I will see what I can do to go through them. So this one in particular, I think something was mentioned, but, but I'll see if you have anything new to say. Susan says, I am a library junkie, love to visit them whenever I travel. How did you decide to use a library in your novel? Well, I think the library chose me rather than I chose the library. It was really a case of, hearing the story of these amazing librarians and wanting to talk about them. Um, living in Paris, you see so many streets and so many metro stations that are named after men. There are very few metro stations, um, bridges, um, streets named after women in France. There was finally a, a, a bridge built about 20 years ago that's called the Simon de Beauvoir Bridge. But other than that, you know, it's a lot of the bridges are named after men. There is a metro stop for a revolutionary woman named Louise Michel, but it's outside of Paris. And so I really wanted to talk about women's contributions and um, the librarians' contributions. That was really important to me. And so that's one of the reasons that I chose this library. And I, I wanted to raise awareness that women were a part of the war as well and that they, they resisted and they really played an important part. Mm. From a different Susan, and this was touched on a little bit already as well, but what writers have influenced you? You know, I, um, I grew up in Shelby, Montana, and my mom went to school with James Grady, who wrote Six Days of the Condor, which became Three Days of the Condor with um, Faye Dunaway and Robert Redford. He has a new book out, um, and I'm super excited to read it. It just came out. I've got to go to the store and get it. Um, so just knowing that James Grady was out in the world writing books let me know that maybe I too could write books. And so he has been really important um, and just very kind. He's such a fabulous speaker and has such a wonderful um, skill of analysis. 
I, I just admire him very, very much. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading his book. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention Bel Canto again about how, um, about how Anne Patchett takes these disparate people and brings them together with a touch of humor. Um, I, I don't think we have enough humor in books and humor is so hard because everything, ev not everyone finds the same things funny. So I really admire people who can add that touch of, of whimsy or of humor or wryness to a book. I, I really, I really appreciate that quite a lot. Um, I feel it's very hard for me to talk about books. Um, every week I try to um, write a, a blurb for a book that I've read or to put a little review on Goodreads um, because I feel like so many people give one star reviews and it breaks my heart to see that negativity out in the world. I, you know, I think all of us book lovers, we all know how much people pour into books. Um, so, um, but I do find it hard to um, talk about books. So I'm amazed at you, Carol, because you just you just do it so eloquently. Um, it's, it's just like talking about love. Why do you love your husband? Yeah, you know, you can give reasons, but would they really be the essence of that love? And so I really love how you can share your excitement and your enthusiasm for books. Um, right now I'm reading a book called Set in Stone, which is about um, two gay women in the 1400s in Moldova. And so that's been a really interesting book. It's kind of like a fairy tale. It reads as a fairy tale and I'm enjoying that. And then Patty, um, Patty Henry has brought out a new, is bringing out a new book um, that I'm really excited to read too. So those are some, some upcoming books that I'm, I've, I've read and I'm looking forward to. Have you been blurbing books for people? Have people come after you for blurbs after your success? Well, um, even before I love I love reading and I um, I I love writing I I love helping other people promote their work because mm -hmm. um, I love talking even if I'm not very good at talking about books I love I I do love talking about it mm -hmm. so yes I enjoy it and I have a rule that anything I don't like I don't talk about like I don't talk negatively about books that's my rule too I just won't I just I'll just say it, it's not for me um, mm -hmm. but yeah no I'm I feel the same way why be negative. I find so many times that I'm on these Facebook reader pages and people are going, I hated this book. Who else hated it too? And I'm like, really? This is really how we're going to start off the day? And I and people say to us, like, you know, you don't run negative reviews. And I said, I don't need to be the arbiter of taste. I really don't. I don't, I don't hold myself in such high esteem that I think I am the arbiter of taste. And I've picked books and put them on our town Facebook page and said, I really love this. And people said, like, I didn't get it. I just didn't like it. And I'm like, okay. It's fine. I'll share your opinion. I don't really care. You know, I'll take it. I'll take it on the chin. It's all right. You know, so other questions, Austin? Yes. Mary Lou says the use of the Dewey Decimal System and the way characters used that system as a kind of shorthand is so clever. Where did that idea come from? I think Odile has a really hard time expressing herself. And I think it's easier for her to use numbers than words. Um, and so I really wanted her to just kind of have that shorthand with herself or a way to organize the world around her. And uh, I had Simone Gallo check and double check my, my, my Dewey Decimal numbers because I was really afraid that librarians would say, you're doing it wrong. But luckily <laughs> no one's written to me to say that I've done it wrong. So thank you, Simone, I appreciate the help. They've been the same in the 40s and now? Like, did there, they... no, there have been um, several changes as more and more subjects have been added or they've melded subjects together. So I use the ones now. Um, okay. I use the ones now. I did not want Simone to have to dig back through those books and find out. Um, he could have, um, but um, I would never have asked him of that. Interesting. Here's a question from Linda Are you a member of a writer's group? And as you write, who do you have read your work? I am a member of a writer's group. I find that writing is so solitary that it's nice to have the camaraderie. And I really like reading other people's work and seeing flaws in other people's work. Like if someone's having a problem with dialogue and that's something that I tag, then I look at my own and I realize, oh, wait, I have the same problem. And maybe that's why I'm noticing it. I couldn't see it in my own work, but seeing it in someone else's work somehow makes it easier for me to see in my own work. So it's super helpful. And it's super gratifying to see someone's first draft um, turn into something beautiful and come out into the world. It's there, there's just nothing 
um, more beautiful than, than that, than that, to see these ideas and enthusiasm and then the hard work and the years, finding an agent, finding a publisher, bringing it out. Um, so I, I really love that process and feel really lucky. I'm reading Pancakes in Paris by Craig Carlson, which is a delightful book. He's um, written a, a follow-up to it, um, Let Them Eat Pancakes. And he has a he has a diner in Paris called um, Breakfast in America because when he came to when he came to Paris he said the only thing missing in Paris is an American diner and so he did not know how to cook he never owned a business but um, he opened one and uh, has been a huge success um, a lot of people a lot of Parisians stand in line to get into his restaurant so. Um, I don't even remember what the question was, um, but. I uh, yes, I just I, I I love I love reading and um and talking about people's work. Well, so you were talking about being oh, in a writer's yes, group. Yes, he was. Yes, he's in my writing group. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> How many um drafts of your book did you do? How many drafts were there of the Paris? Of like tons and tons. I'm not sure that I work in drafts because I'm a I fiddle all the time. So I um some people can just write a first draft and then a second draft, and so I just fiddle 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 fiddle. Fiddle, 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 fiddle. And so it just was, it took a really long time and uh, a lot of different, a lot of different, um, a lot of different versions. And uh, I started out all in Montana and then the second half was all in Paris. And then I started um, putting them together and then the Paris section came first. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of experimentation with the uh, with the book, but it, it took probably, I started writing it in 2010 and it sold in 2019. Wow. So that was a lot of writing and research and rewriting and trying to find an agent. Wow. All here's, a question, here's a question from Valerie. Uh, politics aside, how do you feel when you read about banned books in the USA lately? Are there other countries passing these bans? Um, I don't know why we put politics aside. Um, <laughs> banning is wrong, period. It makes me feel sick and it mm. makes me feel sad. Um, I actually work for food um, for a long time. I tutored um, two children whose parents own a Japanese restaurant. So I would get um, a food coupon when I taught. And so one of our modules um, when I was teaching these two teenagers was about banned book week. And what was really surprising to me was the evolution of books banned. When I was a young person 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it was books with sex. So um, Judy Blooms Forever um, was banned. And so then um, after that, um, it's it, books featuring gay characters were banned or books featuring suicide were banned. And, and now um, books featuring um, tips on how to be anti-racist are, are banned. And so it, I think it really shows us what our, some people in our country fear and I think what's really sad about book banning is a lot of people who ban books have not actually read the books they're banning. They're just like mm -hmm. scary, no bad. And um, I'll tell you what my mom told me um, because my mom would not let me watch Joni Loves Chachi <laughs> growing up, the spinoff from Happy Days. And later on, she said, I wish we would have watched it together and talked about why it made me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think that's what's important to do is to read it together, talk through the discomfort. And I wish our leaders could, could do that, the community leaders could do that rather than to just blindly lash out and say, these books are bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a graphic novel a couple of years ago that the seniors in high school were reading and everyone was very, very up in arms about this book. I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering the title off the top of my head. I'm very bad at that. But everybody's really upset about this. And it was becoming this big cause celeb. And I just said, well, let me just think about something. These are seniors, second semester. Next year, you're going to go to college and you're going to have no idea what your children are reading. And yet you're making a big deal about this book right now. And it was just this moment to me of, we're not talking about fourth graders. We are talking about people who are seniors. And I was 
just appalled that we were having this conversation. I was actually embarrassed because people were saying this is what we should do. And it was a graphic novel. And I, we'd had a graphic novel site for a while when I knew how much people fought against bands about these books. And I was like, I can't believe this is my town that I'm actually you know, hearing this about. And a lot of people who write had not read the book. They had no idea. Oh, there's going to be a picture of like something sexual on page X and blah, 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 blah. And they were honing on like five pages in a book that was maybe 250 pages. And that's the moments where you just sit there and go, wait a second, what are we doing here? So it's it's really sad. Austin, you're back on, sorry. Yeah, uh, let's see, there's a question from Bonnie. If you weren't an author or a librarian, what occupation would you choose? Well, I'm a teacher as well. I love teaching. I love working with young people. And for every reason Carol said about being in the book group she's in, where you hear about people's lives. And I do love different friendships with different generations because, you know, we get the wisdom from older people. We get the energy, creativity, and hope from the younger people. Um, I, I have to say I was, I, would, um, I was teaching engineering students for seven years, um, doing creative writing with them. And just every week I felt so optimistic about the world because they were just wonderful, wonderful students. So mm -hmm. I, um, I, would, I, I teach and so that's what I would be doing. Uh, and another question, I'm wondering how you, sorry, this is from, from somebody else named Bonnie. I'm, I'm wondering how you chose the books and the quotes that are scattered throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Did the book slash quotes just come to you or did you intentionally try to bring in very specific ones? Some of them just came to me and some of them I, I had a theme I wanted, I was thinking about and I needed a, I needed a, a quote to underline that theme. Um, some of them, I just, the books are so beautiful that I, I really wanted to highlight those books. I think for the bridge to Terabithia, I read that as a child and um, remembered liking it. And then so many years later, the son of the author made the movie and I saw it on an airplane, which is where I see most of my movies. And the credits started to roll at the beginning of the movie and I started to bawl like a baby. Mm -hmm. I just bawled through that entire movie. And I realized childhood literature lives inside of us. Mm -hmm. And it was just an incredible moment to realize that that book was still inside me. And I didn't, I hadn't realized it until that moment. Um, so I, I just, I, I really wanted, that was a book I really wanted to highlight. I really love um, Their Eyes Are Watching God. There's so many beautiful lines in that book. Jean Reese was ahead of her time. She's really known in Paris. People in, readers in Paris really love her, I think, but I'm not sure she's known outside of Paris so much. So I wanted to highlight her. Um, I just really wanted to pay homage to these amazing authors. Do you know, one thing I'm gonna just jump in on banned books or books that are controversial. When we were at ABA that year, when we were in Baltimore, they had a session where they were talking to booksellers about what do you do about having conversations about this? And they said that they would bring people in to read a book that was from two opposite sides of the aisle and to have a conversation about it. And they said, it's amazing that the people who would possibly yell on Twitter or be very brash about their opinions, how sitting at a table and looking at somebody in the eye the conversation is completely different because you're seeing each other as people. And they were saying how they facilitated so many conversations where people were actually walking away saying, I hear what you're saying, even if I don't completely agree. And hearing it, I think was one of the most important things that people can be doing right now is just listening because there's an awful lot of not listening anymore. There's the echo chamber and we don't get into politics on the site, but I found it was very interesting to see that that's what that bookstore was doing and it had worked so well for them. And I just felt that's a really good idea to sit there and, and talk about with people. Because I think that's an excellent suggestion because I think a lot of, I, I think a lot of of the noise begins on the internet where it's a voice and we don't know who's speaking, but um, people repost and get all up in arms. And so it is nice to just be able to sit down and have a real conversation. You know, for everything that's good about the web is, which is what we do all day long. And I love what we do. There's a, so much that I've seen through the years. When we first started out, we were on AOL and chat was moderated everything was moderated. There were people that were in chat rooms. We had little children chat, believe it or not. And the little children, if they said like, you know, I'm going on vacation, this is my address. If you want to send me a postcard, 
they all got like, you know, thrown out of the room and we would lecture them on what to do. And it was made me really crazy when the um, law came around, the COPA law. And we said that kids could no longer be on until they were 13. So like something like magical is going to happen when you're 13, which is when most kids are exceedingly dumb, is they're now going to be able to do whatever they want online. And it's like putting them on Route 78 on roller skates. But that was okay. And I went down, I remember in Washington, I was testifying because I said, I just think this is the, the most ridiculous thing that you're taking us away from talking to kids because we would be marketing to them. So we couldn't do what we were doing anymore. And it was just be, we, but we had monitors on every message board. We had monitors in all the chats. And I watch a lot of these things, these, these groups that come up on Facebook or these these conversations happening out on Twitter where no one is in charge and somebody, I'm not saying that they're the person that sits there and says, this is what you have to do, but it's like, let's just be civil. And a lot of the civility just goes away. We would just ban people. It's like, you know, I didn't get that super involved, but I know people were banned, you know? And I do remember dial up internet. Yes, Mindy, I do. It was so sad. <laughs> On a bit of a different tack, uh, an anonymous attendee says, somebody noted in the chat that there seem to be a lot of novels about libraries recently. Why do you think that is? Um, I'm not sure. I, I noticed I noticed when my book came out, there were a lot of a, a lot of books about libraries and librarians. And uh, I, I hope that it's because libraries and librarians are finally getting the credit they deserve. And uh, um, I think a lot of times libraries are, are a bit in danger. Whenever there's um, budget cuts, it seems like libraries are always the, the first funding to get cut. So I, I hope that these books remind um, readers and if they're made into movies, film goers, the importance of, of libraries. I think people like to read books about books. They like to read books about books and stories about books and readers are nat naturally acclimate themselves to wanting to read that. It's like people wanting to read about the world of magazines. There's a book coming out called 100 Girls and it's about a magazine where 100 girls all wanted that job and you got the job. So you're know, like, this is what's going on in your life. And I'm, I have a copy of this book. It's, I'm just dying to read it because it's true. Everybody thinks you've got the golden job. You've got the great job. And then it ends up to be something like The Devil Wears Prada, you know, some version of that. But I think the books about books is people want to see how others interact with books, what other people do. And it's a world that a book lover knows. That's the reason I think it like, you know, happens. So yeah, I think that's a wonderful answer. I just wrote down 100 Girls. I'm going to look it up. Yeah, it's, 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 I can't remember what's coming out. I think it's coming out very soon. But and it's been related because I, I think as readers, we're all a bit obsessed with libraries. Um, Jill asks, what are your favorite bookstores in Paris and in the USA? I love the Red Wheelbarrow Library or the Red Wheelbarrow Bookshop in Paris. It's right across from the Luxembourg Garden. It's owned by Canadian Penelope Fletcher, and it is my happy place in Paris. I spend, if I have spare time, that's where I go. I love browsing. I love the connections that are made with book lovers. Um, it's really a special, special place. Um, there's Cassio Q books in Great Falls, Montana that I really enjoy going to when I'm here. I love all bookshops, really. I mean, you can't go wrong in a bookshop. Tonight I'm doing, um, um, after this event, I'm doing a, a, an event online at um, Chapter One in Hamilton, Montana. So it's, um, I'm just so happy that we have this technology to connect and that, mm -hmm. we can, um, that we can read all these amazing books and have all these amazing opinions from booksellers. Have you been to Books and Books in Miami? Have you been there? No, no, I haven't been there yet. One of my favorites, absolutely one of my favorites with the courtyard and everything. I absolutely love that one. I loved the old tattered cover that was down, um, it's right on Wincoop and I can't remember which street, but I loved that older store. And I know that they've moved and they've changed and things like that, but we don't have a big indie around us. We don't in New Jersey and it's really, like you think that there would be a store, but no, there's not. And it's, it's a definite, it's a, it's, you have the library, but not to have a store like that, I think is a big deal. I feel like we're, yeah, we could be in the middle of Montana, you know, take the chopper. It looks like we've got two questions left. Okay. Uh, the first is from Ellen. I found a part of the part about the denunciation letters interesting, especially that the Paris police had to investigate each letter. How did you find out about that aspect of your story? 
I went to the um, Holocaust Museum in Paris, which has a library and archives. And so I read the archive section on these letters. They had several letters. And so of course they were written in French. And of course they were very difficult to translate because the, the, the authors of the letters were just so angry that they, they made no sense. They jumped from topic to topic and, and um, angry point to angry point. Um, so it was very depressing and demoralizing to read these horrible letters written by these angry people lashing out for absolutely no reason. Um, colleagues um, denouncing each other, family members denouncing each other, neighbors denouncing each other. Um, they're, they're in the Holocaust Museum in, in Paris. So that's why I wanted to write about, uh, I think it's an important thing to write about that. It continues um, today, there are all sorts of denunciations. And um, as I showed in my book, it, 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 you know, it's a question of jealousy. It's a, it, it, that corrosive jealousy that is so dangerous. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about your time in the Ukraine, when I am watching the destruction, I mean, the just bombing destruction of what's going on, I'm thinking back on books that I've read and books that were set in World War II where they described that there was the front of the building, but not the back. So you thought you could go home and you couldn't. And I'm seeing that and I'm thinking they're talking about a school or a hospital being hit, but how many libraries were hit? How many people's book collections in those homes were hit? And I think that when you're a reader, you see these things and you immediately call to mind things that you've read in books where this is what ended up happening. And you realize that while we're seeing buildings and destructions here, it's bringing in the people's lives because that's what you've read about in the book, the heart and soul of what was going on. And you can hear it on TV, but it's not like that was my house, like right there. We haven't, we haven't seen a lot of, you know, that conversation going on, but mm. Austin, did you say one more? Yeah, one more question from Mindy. Um, are you a plotter or a pantser? Do you have a little bit of both? A little bit of both. A little bit of both, because I think uh, I think character should always surprise you. For example, um, for the first several years I was writing this, Odile died at the end, and so she surprised me by living. And um, and it was actually it was actually Margaret's character that made me realize that Odile had to live because I realized these two friends were not finished yet and they had to reunite. So when Lily goes to Paris, she finds that Margaret is still um, is is still um, volunteering at the library. And, and so that really surprised me. And I, I think it was Robert Frost that said, no, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And I, I, I believe that's true. Oh, that was terrific. Janet, I thank you so much for joining us this evening. I really so appreciate it. It was such a special evening and we're so glad to have you as always. Oh, thank you so much. I was thrilled to be here. Thank you, everyone, for these wonderful questions. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Austin, for this wonderful event. And thank you, readers. Thank you. And thank you to Austin, who is our voice of God, who always does such a great job of putting the questions in great order to share with everyone. You know, um, when uh, here's a big one more question for you, Janet. Next, we know what you're writing. When do you think we're going to see it? Any kind of a timeline? I'm hoping it's not going to be 2048, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give yourself a little bit of leeway. All right, all right, all right. It's not going to be 10 years this time. Okay. I, hope not. I will take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay, just remember you can call the chopper in the morning. Just say Thank that because you. you're in Montana. You get to do that. I can take the chopper. <laughs> take the chopper. And a quick reminder to everybody that we're going to make tonight's talk available on YouTube and on our podcast next week. And we'll alert you when that is live. Anybody who signed up tonight, you'll get a note. You share with people in your book group. And a reminder that we have 157 book reporter talks to author interviews on our YouTube channel or where you listen to podcasts, including an earlier interview with Janet. And while we touched on a lot of topics tonight, you may want to go back and listen to that. And we'll actually put a link to that in the notes. So you'll be able to find that as well. And um, you want to stay on top of what we're doing at the Book Report Network, like our Bookachino Live monthly uh, event, which is usually, it's usually the second Wednesday of the month in June. It's going to be the third Wednesday. And when we go do those events, we preview what's coming up in the next four weeks and tease something two months out. So you want to sign up for that. Make sure you sign up for our Book Reporter newsletter. Easy to do it right on the site. If you do that, you'll never miss an event. Those who are invited this evening, you're also on our big invite list. So going forward, you will be invited to future events that are happening. 
Uh, we do not have anything on the schedule for a book club event at this time. We're not sure if we're going to take the summer off. We, we know a lot of people are on vacation during the summer, and there are a lot of beautiful nights during the summer. We used to joke that if you did a library event, you want it to be raining a little, not pouring rain. But not too much. Yes. But not too nice. But not too nice. Maybe it won't show up. So we're still trying to figure if we're going to do anything this summer, we're going to pick up again in September. But meanwhile, lots going on still on the site and lots going on with our monthly events and interviews. Janet, enjoy. Thanks Thank again. Thank and safe travel so back to Paris. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. And good night.